Welcome to The Investing Show, where we discuss the ideas to help you become a better investor and make your, more of your money. I'm Simon Lambert of This Is Money. Joining me in the studio today, I'm very pleased to welcome Lars Croyer. Lars, yeah. welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, this is a bit of a departure for The Investing Show. Normally, we uh, have a fund manager or another active investor on, and we talk about how they invest, how they look to find the best investments, what you can learn from them, how you can take that and try and beat the market. But today's guest is actually here to tell us that we can't beat the market and we shouldn't even try and that there is a more simple and rational way to invest that will do us better in the long term. Lars, very interested to talk to you about this. Um, why do you say to people you, you can't beat the market? Don't try and beat the market. Yeah. Well, I think you have to start with the premise of who are you as an investor. I'm not saying markets can't be beaten, period. I just think that for each individual investor, they have to say, am I the, the person who is able to compete with the many, many trillions of dollars floating around there with access to better information, cost structures, analysis, and so forth? And statistically speaking, the answer is the overwhelming majority of retail investors massively underperform the market whether it's because they themselves pick stocks, or sort of say, should I buy Facebook now, or Google now, or General Atlantic, or UK equivalents, or it's because then they buy very expensive actively managed funds. So if you look across a broad array of investors over a long period of time, they massively underperform. So you have to ask yourself, how am I not in that bucket? How am I somehow able to know something or analyze something that puts me ahead of you know, the incredible aggregate knowledge that is the market. And I'm saying most people can't, and they shouldn't try. And as an alternative to that, they should buy the broadest, cheapest, tax-efficient access to the overall market that they can. So in the UK, that would be to buy some sort of a FTSE tracker, index tracker. Um, but even better than that, they should go global, and they should buy... Uh, and here we'll just talk for equities yeah. for a minute, uh, they should buy a global equity index tracker tax efficiently. And if they do that and they do nothing else, they think, need to think about risk, obviously, they need to think about tax and their exposures, but that's really it because then you are the market. You perform like the market, less minor, minor fees. And, and over the long term, that will make a massive positive, it's what will likely make a massive positive difference to your savings. And in your book, Investing Demystified, you talk about this, this thing called the edge. Mm -hmm. do, do investors have the edge? Mm. And what you say is that actually most investors don't have the edge right. because they're up against a huge investment industry that's packed full of very, very clever people mm. and that it's highly unlikely that the ordinary person can try to beat that investment industry. Mm -hmm. But that investment industry does spend quite a lot of time telling people that if only they sign up with them, mm -hmm. they can beat them, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, um, well, that's their job, right? <laughs> that's how they make money <laughs> is to get you to sign over your savings and have them manage it for you at a high, at a high fee. Um, I think it's important to then take the next step and say, so if you acknowledge that you yourself can't outperform the stock selection of some highly skilled, well-trained, well-paid investment professional. The next question is, why don't I just give that person my money to manage? And again, I think you go back to statistics. And you say, there's a, if we dis distinguish between passively managed money, so this is index tracking, you blindly follow the market, and then that costs next to nothing. And actively managed, which is what you see on all the billboards, um, where actively managed is the expensive, highly educated person that manages your funds for you. The, the difference in fees and expenses incurred by the act over the past is it's such that about one out of 10 of them outperforms the market over a 10 year period, right? So then the next question, so if you believe that math and that's statistically true in academic research and also logically true, they underperform by roughly their fees, which makes sense. Now, if you believe that, then the next question is, can I ahead of time pick the one that's gonna outperform? Now, there's no evidence to suggest that the one that outperformed the last 10 years will outperform the next 10 years. Um, there's no evidence that someone called Bill instead of someone called Bob or anything like that outperforms. Um, and the answer for vast majority of people is just like they can't outperform by picking Facebook instead of Google or any other stock. They can't outperform by picking one investment fund over another investment fund. 
And it comes back to the same point, just pick the market. And it also has other advantages besides it being cheaper and more diversified and probably more tax efficient. It also means you sort of don't have to worry about it. You don't have to get up in the morning and wonder whether you know, Fidelity outperformed Threadneedle or Facebook outperformed Google, because you're just saying, I'm not really in a position to know. And all I know is that I have exposure to the overall stock market, the overall in the entire world. So I'm incredibly diversified. I worry less about any one stock or any one economy or any one currency. Um, and that means that you should think very hard about your risk, like you always should, and your exposure to the market. But you sort of don't have to spend a lot of time keeping track of individual investments. And I can, I can read the comments below this video before it's published. I can, I can, <laughs> I can hear our, our viewers saying, well, hang on a minute. I, I, I understand your point. And yeah. You know, I've read many, many things about passive investment, but my active fund manager last year did twenty mm. percent, and the market did ten percent, mm -hmm. and I've got an active fund manager who did that the year before, and the year mm. before, and the year before. But is the problem that we don't we put too much emphasis on recent returns mm -hmm. from those fund managers? We don't have look at a long enough track record of individuals to mm. see whether they do genuinely they genuinely are that rarely yeah. skilled person who can outperform yeah. the market. Yeah, let me, let and also just because they, they also sometimes it might just be that their style mm. was in favour for a mm -hmm. short period of time mm -hmm. and what happened in the future may not reflect mm. that style. Well yes yeah, so obviously there's an issue of the style that there is uh, you know over the next ten years if you know that small caps will do phenomenally well and you know that ahead of time and it wasn't luck that you so happened to pick it that's an amazing advantage to know. Um, but just addressing the point of your, your fund manager having done well, first of all, there's a lot of marketing in there. <laughs> you know, if you're at Fidelity, you have a hundred funds or several hundred funds. So if you see the ad at Fidelity saying, you know, the top performing fund manager the last five years in a row, well, yeah, one out of the hundred probably is the top performing one because they just have so many. They probably neglect to mention the worst performing out of the hundred. Um, there is also the point that, you know, it is one out of ten that outperforms the index and those guys are not going to be quiet about it. You know, the, the, the one that performed the worst out of ten is long gone. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some amazing statistical sort of bias in those numbers that if you looked at just the ones that are still around, they will have do, done disproportionately well. Right? But also, in the, sh the shorter the time period, the less the fees will matter. And if you say that the advantage on an annual basis of an active versus passive manager is all in, and I'm not just talking about the headline number, but also trading costs, uh, audit fees, accounting fees, board fees, etc., like that, all these things, call it it's 1.75% around that. In one year, um, because the, the variance of performance of funds, that means that maybe you know 45% underperform the index. And, and then you can multiply that out and over a 10-year period, that's going to be a very small number that has outperformed over a 10-year period. But in shorter time periods, you're going to see periods of massive outperformance. The answer is, again, could you have seen that ahead of time? And if you could, get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> the overwhelming uh, evidence that it, you, you can't, certainly not as a retail investor. And if somebody has said, OK, I get this. I hear what you're saying. I think this might be a good idea. Mm. Um, and they want to go and build this rational, simple portfolio that you say in your book mm. can help them avoid sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. How do they go about doing that? What are the building blocks? Um, well, so in the book, um, and I should pitch my videos, I made some YouTube videos around this topic that I meant to capture a lot of this in like five minutes. but. I basically try to take something incredibly, incredibly complicated, such as investing your savings, and make it very simple. And it actually, in, in, on, on one level, it is very simple. So if you take the equity markets, let's just start there. You can actually accomplish the perfect product with one investment. So if you can buy some exposure that captures the global equity markets. So that could be an exchange traded fund, an ETF, an index fund of sorts that is a world equity index trader. That is one thing you need to buy. Okay, so that's it, you're done with equities. Like, that was not hard, right? Now be sure about taxes as always. But then you should also say, well, anyone worth this all would say, well, don't just buy equities. Think about your risk. And I, everyone in finance would agree with that, I hope. So then let's say you're a UK investor. And let's say you, your horizon is a 10-year time horizon. 
then you have available to you um, one of the lowest risk investments in the world, which is UK government bonds. And let's say over a 10 year time horizon, you buy government bonds with roughly the same time horizon as your investment horizon, so 10 years, and you have equity, in, in equity world equity index trackers. Those are true investment products. And then you combine those two according to your risk. Okay, so now that's pretty simple, right? You have two buckets and you weigh them according to your individual risk profile, which is something that if you're not comfortable with it, read up on it, do online service, talk to an advisor. But your investment portfolio consists of two products. That's it. You're done. It's very simple. So looking at and, and when people are weighing up that risk profile, obviously it's going to be different for different people, mm. and there's a bit of thought that they, there's quite a bit of thought they need to put into that. It's mm. quite mm. an important element. Yeah. But if you were taking someone who was, for example, in their mid forties, they were investing with a fifteen year time horizon. Mm. Um, how much? What sort of percentage of equities to bonds mm. would they be looking at? Where would they place yeah. themselves on the scale? I think I hate to evade that question. Mm. It's not really my area, if yeah. you will. Um, I do think it's very individual, also for reasons of simple risk tolerance, like how do you feel if you lose money? How, um, what's your house worth? Yeah. What is your access to alternative income if, you're, if your investments do poorly? You mean, the more you have buffers, the more you can probably afford to take risk with your equity investment. Also. How much will it hurt you to retire with less money than you planned? It's, you know, it's a very individual mm -hmm. thing. There are all sorts of rules of thumb. I try to stay away from them, such as like, what is it a uh, hundred minus your age should be in equities? There are all these I, I have them in my book. I can't even remember them, but I generally would caution because they are exactly that. They're rules of thumb. Um, but I think a, a simple thing is if you invest in the markets and markets are down, how do you feel about that? Some people actually feel good because it allows them, in their minds, to invest more at a lower price. That means you probably took too little risk. Yeah. You know, if you if you wake up in the morning really, really hoping markets didn't decline, then you probably got too much of it. So this, that gut feel probably captures a lot more than a lot of people think. I make one other pitch for um, why you should diversify. Uh, across the globe, it's that if you take a country like the UK, um, it's very, very typical that people who look not just at their investment portfolio but their overall finances, they fail to capture that they're actually hugely concentrated. Right? So their biggest asset is often the equity in their house or their apartment. Their second biggest asset is their career income, which is often a locally based job. Now, their education is often locally based. If they, on top of that, buy local pension products and those things, and, and otherwise invest in local equities, they are incredibly exposed to their local economy, be it UK or, or, or even more local than that. And if you can lessen that exposure by diversifying away geographically, um, you're going to do better. It's, it's less risk for a, 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 a similar uh, expected return profile. And that's, I think, actually one of these massively underexplored areas in, in, in personal finance, that most people take vast and unnecessary concentration risks that they don't get compensated for. And it's why once in a blue moon you hear these stories, um, particularly around the subprime market where people lost their house and their jobs and their savings and their company stock all at the same time and for the same reason, which is because of a massive lack of diversification. So there's a question of being clever about the risk you take and then the absolute risk level that you take. And so, so there's a, a process of self-reflection effectively that I goes on in that in, in terms of, you, you have know. to be holistic about it, right? Your investment portfolio is often only a small part of your overall assets. And, and I think what you should do with that, I'm hopefully very clear on, that there is a very good, very simple answer. But also think about your other assets. It could be that your investment portfolio represents 5% of your overall assets. And the other 95% is your company stock at the local company and your local house. And so you're still in trouble if things go ter terribly wrong there. So do think about that and incorporate that into your risk profile. And when people taking the equity, uh, the global equity tracker example, mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems I think many people have with that and also with the, the using bonds to invest in is that at the moment they would, might say okay well and good I understand the theory um, 
I can look at the risk, I can, I can weigh those things up. But when I look at that global equity tracker, it's got 60% invested in the US. Mm. I know that the US market, stock market, is expensive by historic mm-hmm. standards. Mm. Um, and then I look at other regions where I think that perhaps the world's growth is going to come from, and my mass market you know, mm. global equity tracker has barely anything at all you know, in mm. a emerging markets mm. or in emerging Asia or something like that, mm. and I think that's where the growth is going to come mm. from. Mm-hmm. So should I be tilting my investments that way? But, and then they also look at the supposedly safe part, of their investments at bonds, mm. and they say, "Well, hang on a minute. Mm. Bond yields are near record yes. lows. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and the prices are at near record yep. highs. So, is that really the safe part of my portfolio? Mm. So, how can people who are worried about that? those things reconcile yeah. that?" Let me give you two uh, contradictory answers, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so, let's take the first one about the equity exposure of the U.S. market, which is, I think, it's closer to fifty percent, and yeah. it is declining. Uh, so, what that means in layman's terms is that if you buy the global equity markets. Uh, through some sort of a, a product, 50% of that will be U.S. stocks. Right Now, that sounds wrong. The U.S. Uh, economy is about 20% of the global economy and declining. A um, couple of ways to look at that. First of all, of those U.S. stocks, they have about half their earnings abroad. So you can say indirectly, and that's, by the way, not true that the foreign stocks have earnings in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So indirectly, you have a much more global exposure than the market cap suggests. The other uh, part to that is that if you consider the first statement we talked about, which is that you can't beat the markets. So you have many, many trillions of dollars saying that you know, Facebook is worth X and the leading uh, Indian internet stock or Chinese internet stock or bank or whatever have you is worth Y. Now, if you say anything other than that, so let's say Facebook is worth 100 and the Indian was is worth 5. If you say anything other than that, you're essentially saying that all those people that bought Facebook should have bought the Indian one. And you're implicitly saying you know something that the market doesn't. And that gets back to this point, can you really beat the market? Statistically, you can and so forth. Uh, so, so that's sort of the, the slightly academic answer. Um, of course, I, I get that, and, and I too think it's seemingly crazy, but it's very hard um, to consistently be right once you deviate from this philosophy that I just buy the market, and I don't say I buy the market except for this thing. Um, but if you were to do it differently, one thing you could do is to say, well, for every hundred I invest, I invest, you know, 50 in the global market and 50 or just call it 25 in, in, um, in emerging Asia and 25 in the emerging markets. So you should probably do less than that. But you can sort of address this gut feel uh, in, in, in ways that doesn't, should we say, massively contradict this idea that you can't beat the markets. But you are making a pretty bold statement, mm-hmm. namely that all these well-paid, brilliant financiers are all wrong. Mm. And, and, and you know something that they don't. And which, a lot of people, when they're looking at that, don't realize that, that actually, unless they are looking at that global equity market makeup and then seeing how they vary from it, they could be varying from it substantially, mm-hmm. even by putting, for example, 25% of their money into a UK tracker. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's already they're taking, compared to the rest of the world, they're taking a very big bet on the UK. In that Absolutely. Instance, if they? you have more than, I think, is it 3 or 4% of your equity exposure in the UK, you are implicitly saying that the UK will outperform, mm-hmm. which in, in its own right is a bold statement. But then when you add to that um, the fact that most people watching this will have massive exposures to the UK already. So don't add to that exposure by overweighing UK equities. Mm-hmm. You're plenty long the UK. If the UK does phenomenally well the next couple of decades, that's going to impact you in all sorts of positive ways. Don't add to that by overweighing UK equities. And what about the, the bond element where mm-hmm. people are worried about the, the low yields, the high prices? Yeah. Is, is, it, is that a genuine worry in terms of that safety part of their yeah, portfolio? I think, let, let me ask you back, what is the safest investment in the world? I literally, if just think anything, I give you 100 quid and you can buy the safest thing you can imagine. Well, like suppose, you really just don't want to lose money right now. Well, I right? suppose most people would say cash, but you're right. going to be struggling to beat yeah, inflation. You're not going to beat inflation. There's storage issues, like don't put it under your pillow. There are lots of issues around the cash, including not just inflation, right? which is, you say cash in the bank may be slightly better, but 
for some people, you're actually taking banking risk, and the bank is guaranteed by the state, so you're indirectly taking the state risk anyhow, and the banks would never survive without the state, etc. Um, so all I'm trying to get to is not something where you try to make money. Like, I'm trying to say, if you had, you know, a hundred pounds now, and in, in one year you need a hundred and five pounds to pay for heart surgery or something, where would you put that money? And that's one bucket of your portfolio where you want to take absolutely no risk. So think of it as the minimal risk asset. And so happens to be UK government bonds and absolutely the yields are horrible. I, I couldn't agree more. And can they decline? Well, they can't go up. <laughs> like, <laughs> the prices can't go up a whole lot because then really people get to the point where they should have the money under their, <laughs> under their pillow. Um, so I think you should rather think it as sort of a, a risk temper. So if you want to take absolutely no risk whatsoever your investments, that's what you buy. Most people should at least take some risk. And with that, you buy the, the, the equity markets. Mm -hmm. And then you combine those two things according to your risk profile. But you're absolutely right. Yields are terrible. I'd also say another thing about equity markets, let's get slightly academic. But while I'm saying you can't predict which way equity markets are going, there is a measure of risk of the equity markets. So it's something um, called the volatility index. And essentially think of it as the market prices the risk of the market. It may sound crazy, but it's sort of think of that as, as what's historically been the best predictor of risk. So right now, if you look at that market, and that because it's a market, you have some faith that it's not just some, it's not a compensator like you and I just yeah. saying, oh, I think it's X. It's actually a market. If you disagree with it and you're right, you can make a lot of money from it. That market is um, at or near its all-time low. Right? So it's essentially saying that equity markets are as bad as non-risky as they've ever been. Which, so, so get your head around that. That doesn't sound right. We're almost as a nuclear war, and, or any time that <laughs> Trump might, like, I don't know, get out on the wrong side of bed, we might have nuclear war or other things you could get up to. It somehow sounds wrong, right? And then, and then you take the next statement and say, well, how is the risk of the market a predictor of future returns? Which I think actually makes a lot of sense, that the lower the risk, the less you should be compensated for that risk. So when the equity markets, man, you have two investments. One is £100 right now in the markets, equity markets, and another is £100 in March 2009. And we all know that after March 2009, things worked out beautifully, but you certainly did not know that at the time. And if you can put yourself in those two positions, you would want to be paid more in March 2009 to invest in the market because it's somehow just a lot riskier. Yeah. So to be compensated for that risk, you want to expect higher returns. So there is uh, evidence that the lower the risk of the market, the lower the future returns. But, and the higher the risk, the higher the future returns. It just kind of makes sense, right? But it is, it's something to keep in mind. So the people that go out there now and have some sort of a statement that the markets are going to be great forever, just keep in mind that they're saying that in the context of the markets themselves saying, well, risk is pretty low, right? So, so you're saying I'm going to get great returns at almost no risk. That seems off. And... Um just, just finally, before we wrap up, um, do you think that in terms of this investing style, if people do say, right, actually, I do want to go for the what I think is the simple, the rational approach, the one where I can avoid the sleepless nights, you know, <laughs> the one where I just don't have to think about it. I do it, and then I don't have to think about it. I put my money in every month. Hmm. Do you think that the, the financial world, the investing world, makes that easy enough for people at the moment? Well... No is the short answer. And, and if you think of why, uh, no one gets paid to tell you that. Like no one charges a lot of fees for this. And so compare that to putting money in an index, sorry, in an active fund where someone gets paid a lot of money, buy expensive cars and live in expensive houses. But just to put this in perspective, I, I have an example in the book where someone who drives a train in the London Underground from the age of 26, which is typical, to retirement. Let's say they on average make 50,000 pounds a year um, and that they put 10% of that in equities every year. Um, and let's further say that equities um, go up like they have historically, so about four or 5% above inflation. The difference at the end of, um, well, the beginning of retirement, so at the end of that person's working life, between having put the money in an active fund and a passive fund, is about 275,000 pounds in today's money. So this is someone who drives a train on the London Underground who will never be able to afford a Porsche and will have paid the financial industry about six or seven Porsches in value. And that's in today's money. That's not some future value. Right? So that's money 
that's in your pocket and not the financial sector's pocket. So of course there's a lot of money going around to pitch you that that's what you should do. And no one makes money on it, or they make minuscule amounts on index tracking. And, and so it's no wonder that this is conventional wisdom, that you should buy what you've always bought. In the old days you had your broker who called you up with stock tips. Now it's online. And then you have the active managers that sell their products online. And on the other hand, you have this thing that's a very lonely place because <laughs> no one really wants to talk to you or sell you this stuff. Um, and, and, and so no wonder it's a harder sell. But it is a massive, massive growth industry. Um, index tracking is about three or four times as big as in, in, in the U.S. it is in the U.K. It's been around longer. Um, it's, it's growing here. It's going to change the financial sector as we know it here. And um, the, the rest of Europe is behind even that. But it's coming because it makes sense. So that's the future. Lars, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Join us next time on The Investing Show. Goodbye.